What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is May 8th of 2022. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's video, I wanna spend some time to talk about the one key chart that I recommend everyone keeps an eye on when it comes to analyzing the crypto market. And it's not just analyzing what Bitcoin's price is doing, but taking a macro perspective and seeing where crypto stands against other markets. And on top of that as well, we've got a sponsored interview with Partesia Blockchain. We're gonna be interviewing Kurt and Brian, who are two of the co-founders of the project. So stay tuned, you guys won't wanna miss it. Let's go ahead and dive into the conversation here. Now, what I wanna start off with here is talk about where we are within price and one of the key charts that I think is going to be a key indicator to see whether or not the sell-off is going to get worse from this point on. We've dropped from around $48,000 to near $34,600, continuing the decline over the last 24 or 48 hours from the recent pullback we got the other day of $10,000 in price. So I wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about the key market metric that is going to play out here when it comes to seeing how Bitcoin is going to hold up over the coming weeks. And that has to do with analyzing the macro perspective of equity markets. Now, we have constantly heard about the correlation between equities and crypto, uh, that there's been a growing correlation that, of course, if equities are going to go down, crypto will come down with it, and vice versa. If equities go up, crypto should go up, right? And this has to, again, do with the kind of mindset that people have built that the Federal Reserve is going to drag all asset markets with it. And all the while, in this case, you know, we have seen a little bit of a correlation between these asset classes here, especially in the near term over the past few months. I'm going to be bringing up a point later on that I think is important to reiterate, but we'll come back to it in a little bit. The first thing we'll dive into again is analyzing the NASDAQ. IXIC or the NASDAQ 100, both great measurements for tracking the NASDAQ here. Now, of course, it is the weekend here, the market is not trading, but we've seen a pretty stark decline here, an over 25% correction from the highs down here towards the lows in regards to price. And it looks like we could very well be in a position where if we do not maintain support at this range here, between the low $12,000 range and 12,600, where we can see that we've had support in the past two times, and also it used to be treated as resistance, this could really spell a bloodbath where equities could go into a full swing 50% correction. And I think this is what some people are very fearful of, a continued sell-off in the FANG stocks and a broader bear market for overall equities. Now, there is a chance here as well that we could bounce at this range. So we need to wait and see what the trend is gonna show us. We just don't wanna to try to trade within this range, you know, trying to get out of positions, trying to get into positions. We wanna wait and see how price is gonna react around this very critical support and resistance range. But the chart I wanna to bring to you all today is one we've talked about many times, and that is the ratio between Bitcoin and the NASDAQ here. And I gotta be honest with you all, as much as this has been proving as a bullish key indicator of sentiment for crypto as we have been since as far back as November 2020, holding in these higher lows here for the ratio. You gotta be honest with you all, no matter what trend line you're drawing here, we are pressing it. We're yet again coming down to this range and pushing right against this line of support. In fact, depending on how you draw the trend line, some people might even say we've broke it. Now, again, I just wanna give some kind of different perspectives here. All in all here, we are at a point of contestment. It is a very critical range that we need to see it was whether or not, no matter if equity markets sell off or they go up in value, that Bitcoin is continuing to outpace it. If we see a break on this support line, it could spell not only that equity markets are likely in for a further sell off down towards that typical 50% range that we've seen in bear markets over the last few decades, really over the last two decades, but on top of that as well, it could show a worrying sign that crypto is bound for even worse sell side pressure. But again, we don't wanna make any assumptions yet. I just wanna bring the chart to your attention. I want you guys to keep an eye on it. Now, in order to actually build this chart, I always like to try to explain how you guys can actually do this yourselves so you guys can track it outside of just my content as well. You wanna first start by just typing in BTC USD, getting some kind of uh, dollar pair against Bitcoin, you know, a typical uh, exchange like Bitstamp will do. Uh, and then outside of that as well, divided by IXIC, or if you wanna get a little bit more information, you can do the NASDAQ 100, which does have uh, the week weekend data as well when the futures markets open. But overall, you're gonna get roughly the same thing here. And it's gonna be, uh, build you this chart here where you can start to see over time the higher lows in price and excuse me, the lower highs in price and the higher lows here, kind of coiling in between these two assets. 
So you guys can build this yourself, track it, you know, follow the trend lines here, watch what the market is doing here, whether or not buyers are coming in here on the lower range of the ratio. And if they're not, it might be a sign here that we could be in for a pretty decent uh, sell off in this case for, um, for crypto alongside equities, or we might see buyers coming in quite strongly. And even though equities might be having a downward trend, crypto might be starting to decouple. And that's why, again, this chart is so important. It's not really to champion a narrative. And yes, I understand uh, it could go up, it could go down. Really useful, Nick. I'm not here to really say that what it's going to do. What I want to do is point your attention to the chart here so you guys can keep it in your arsenal of different ranges and measurements to be able to figure out whether or not you think the market is going to continue going up or down. It's just an important thing to watch. While it has been a bullish indicator for us, at the same time, it could very well break just like we saw with the lower highs and lower lows. Just something to keep in mind. Now, overall, one thing that I think is important to watch here is to keep an eye on the FANG stocks. Now, there are some good metrics out here that can measure FANG, in this case, combining Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. It's the FANG stock index here. You can find this on TradingView. But if you guys want an interesting perspective as to how to really kind of find the value range of FANG, there's a lot of different dynamics we need to keep in mind here that really could help us to determine where we could see a bottom in the FANG stocks. Because quite frankly, what we've got here is we've had a major rally here. And expecting FANG stocks to go down towards any specific range might be difficult considering all the macro conditions that have happened since uh, the pandemic. So if you guys are interested in kind of seeing my perspective as to where FANG stocks and generally speaking, the broad equity market is going to bottom and where we can start to maybe find some value, I definitely recommend you guys check out the Dash Report. We put a really interesting kind of short tidbit article here talking about where we're starting to find value within the equity markets. If you guys sign up for an annual subscription, it's 20% off and you guys can get access to a lot of great macro research that we do from crypto to equities to Forex markets as well as commodities. A lot of interesting things going on in all markets, the dollar picking up steam big time and outside of that as well. We've also got the commodity markets in a spin with the high inflation we've seen in the economy and of course the scare that we've seen in equities and crypto. But going back here, this is kind of the critical chart here that I would recommend you guys keep an eye on here because this wedge is highly significant here. It is showcased that all the while and this is going to be actually the point I wanted to bring up earlier that I said I'd come back to. All the while, we have seen a correlation in these two asset classes. One thing that I really want to emphasize and try to explain to the best of my ability as to why crypto, all the while it might be getting dragged down right now, in the long term, really doesn't care so much about what Fed monetary policy does, is because we have seen already in the past few years what happens when the Fed is raising interest rates and also what it's doing when it's lowering and engaging in quantitative easing, quantitative tightening. Cryptos live through all of it. A lot of people don't know this, but back in 2018, 2019, when there were recession scares, I want to make that very clear, there were the same concerns that there was going to be a recession around the corner. All the while, crypto, in many cases, didn't care about what Fed monetary policy did. There's a great video uh, we did a while back of why the Fed won't kill Bitcoin. And it basically emphasized this point here that if you go back through Bitcoin's price history and you actually divide Bitcoin's, uh, excuse me, not divide Bitcoin's price, just track Bitcoin's price during the periods of quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, and various types of Fed monetary policy, you'll find that all the while equity markets, which are highly driven by that fresh new liquidity, either being added or removed into the asset markets, right? There's a very direct correlation between Fed monetary policy and equity markets, like US stocks. On the other hand, crypto is not exactly the same. And the reason why is because not only is it such a smaller market in this case, it's much smaller than equities. So it doesn't require that kind of concentration. It doesn't have that direct line of, of capital flow. So when there's new money, it doesn't go directly into crypto, it goes more likely into equities. It's the simplest path forward. But on top of that as well, we need to understand one thing here, which is that for crypto overall, we need to understand who's buying it at this point, who's playing a role in driving crypto values higher. And it's people like the Luna Foundation, which just bought 1.5 billion Bitcoin. It's companies like MicroStrategy who are taking loans from private lenders as a corporate company and utilizing that cash to buy more crypto as a portion of their balance sheet. 
That's the kind of buyers who are coming in. And no matter if you reduce the money supply in this case, or for that matter, as a lot of people are talking about, raise interest rates, MicroStrategy is going to take out a loan in this case for you know, 2% right now at current interest rates to go out and buy Bitcoin. If that goes up to 3 or 4%, you think that's going to stop them from taking out that loan and buying more crypto? Or basically uh, financing off of their revenue streams in order to go out there and raise capital, raise debt in order to purchase more crypto. They're going to continue to do it. They don't care about interest rates. The millennials, the Gen Z investors who are putting money into crypto rather than commodities like gold or silver, rather than just going straight into equities like it used to be, they don't care. They're dollar cost averaging. They're picking up positions. And sooner or later, as we have seen from the expansion of the one year HODL wave, you know, the amount of Bitcoin on chain that haven't moved in over a year from the expansion and metrics like that, as well as a growing discount in price here from short term sellers, you are eventually likely going to get buyers coming in. That's what I've learned over the past few years, guys. I've been through a lot of these up and down waves in the market, and I can't emphasize it enough. When fear is riding high, when people are concerned and people are building, you know, kind of dramatic correlations that the Fed is going to drag down Bitcoin, right? I just honestly, again, want to emphasize here that it can be overdone. We can get caught up in tunnel vision and eventually you're going to find in this case that the market will come sweeping in when you least expect it. When enough liquidations have gone through, when enough people have flooded out of their positions, big buyers come in and the market order flow dominates, coming in with the limit bids to support that price range. So anyways, guys. I hope this video has proven helpful for you guys, but let's go ahead and dive in to the interview with Partesia. And if you like this interview that's coming up or the video itself, consider dropping a like. Let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, everyone. So in today's sponsored interview, I'm sitting down with both Brian and Kurt, who are both co-founders of the Partesian blockchain and a part of the foundation tied towards the network. I want to spend some time here today to learn a little bit more about Partesian, share some of the updates that they have with you guys here, and dive a little bit deeper into why their focus on privacy preservation could give them a potential leg up and a potential leader position of being a layer one in the crypto space. Brian, Kurt, thank you guys for making the time. I appreciate having you both here. I know you guys are both busy and it's an exciting time for what you guys are building. So thank you for making the time. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation. You know, to kind of uh, let the developer network and you know, greater community sort of hear about what we're doing. I'm Brian Gallagher. I'm one of the co-founders of Partija Blockchain, as you mentioned, and uh, here with my co-founder Kurt Nielsen as well. And, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you for having us. Uh, I'm uh, Kurt Nielsen. I'm one of the co-founders and uh, president of the uh, Partija Blockchain Foundation. Awesome. Very cool. So on, on that point, guys, um, I was going to ask you all something real quick, which is that my understanding when I was doing my due diligence around Partesia is that you guys have quite a background. This isn't something that just kind of popped up overnight. You guys have had experience kind of working in the private sector, building solutions around uh, privacy preserving technologies, multi-party computation, as well as zero knowledge uh, computation as well. And I do want to dive into some of these terms and why Partesia really offers a lot of value to the market. But maybe you guys can probably give kind of the best quick pitch as to what Partesia is trying to do in kind of simple terms and why it may be valuable. Brian, would you want to maybe kick off on that? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, Partesia, the company, has been around since 2008 and based out of Denmark, building commercial-grade cryptography solutions for huge companies like Bosch, SBI Japan, Tora in Hong Kong. And around 2016, 2017, we started looking into entering blockchain because the specialty of Partesia is MPC technology. So even before establishing as a commercial enterprise, Partesia's team, Ivan Domgar, the chief cryptographer, Jesper Bruce Nielsen, Kurt himself, They've been doing research and development uh, around MPC, multi-party computation, cryptography, since even as early as the 80s. Wow. And 2008 is when the first actual production use case was applied. A Danish sugar auction used Partija's MPC technology to keep all the bids sealed. So multi-party computation is all about allowing multiple parties to compute and share secret data. So in the Danish sugar auction, in any auction using MPC, you essentially can have people bidding 
uh, for whatever's trying to be purchased. And you can keep all the bids sealed and secret so that there's no wash bidding or people bidding mm -hmm. against themselves trying to drive up the price. There's just a duration. And at the end, there's the integrity of the auction where the top bid would be released. So uh, since 2008, the speed of the MPC technology that has been developed by the Partija team has increased by 1 million times. And so around 2017, we started to realize, okay, we can now bring this into a setting where there's a public blockchain and we can you know, sort of attach MPC and merge these two technologies so that you get the transparency and integrity of a public blockchain. You can also then compute on encrypted data, secret data across multiple parties, and then finalize outcomes on a blockchain. Very interesting, Brian. And I actually, I want to kind of pull in Kurt here on this point, because I think this idea of multi-party computation and kind of putting it simple, right, getting past the technical terminology, what you guys are offering for by building a public blockchain and integrating these technologies that you guys have built you're offering the ability for users to be able to do both public standard transactions, but also private. And I think the big breakthrough here is whether you're doing normal transactions or complex smart contracts, you're able to do them not only either on a public or a private framework, but on top of that, as you mentioned, Brian, you allow for multiple parties to be able to work in a private framework, in this case, through multi-party computation and zero knowledge computation. So I'm curious, Kurt, to ask you on kind of like a product perspective, really kind of getting visual here. How can you utilize Partesia to build out some really exciting use cases that just weren't available before? I know Brian had hinted a little bit uh, with the sugar auction in this case, doing like a you know kind of blind auction. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so if you look at blockchain, uh, it's it's basically all uh, about uh, transparency and and mutable ledger. So, so privacy is actually the missing uh, component. So, we have been building these distributed cryptography solutions for in parallel to the development of blockchain. And, and, and we are merging that together with blockchain. So you now have, as, as you mentioned, you have this the capa capability to do any, any computation on, on, on private information as well as any computation on public information. And that's basically what you need for, for any applications, any collaborative application, also to meet any types of regulatory requirements and data protection, as well as transparency right. to combat fraud, et cetera. So that's a very sort of fundamental way that we are solving this that enable you to, to basically uh, do any collaborative ap applications uh, to solve the internet economy in a new way. And that's maybe what is pointing at some of the major use cases that this uh, technology enables for. So you can start with the, the biggest driver of the internet economy, advertisement, and, and you can go in now and you can actually reclaim control of your persona or your personal information. You can be part of that uh, uh, economy of uh, selling you in the advertisement economy and get a fair share of the, of the profit in doing that. So, so that's one of, and a good example of what we can do with this. Another example is, uh, is identity. So it's all starts with identity and you can keep it, keep it private. Uh, you can have self-sovereign identity. Uh, so, so that's also what we can enable with this. And uh, not least, uh, the ability to exchange data. So this is where you, with this technology, you actually move away from sharing data or selling data towards selling the result of some data going into a computation. So you're moving away from sharing to sharing data to sharing results of, of a computation. And, and these are sort of some very sort of uh, fundamental things that goes into a number of applications yep. beyond the options that we talked about and all that. One thing to build on that, Kurt, and like this is something, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I've, I've got this wrong, but the biggest problem that I found so many people really don't value in the blockchain space that does need to be solved for before enterprise companies really get into crypto and blockchain is this pres preservation of privacy and this focus, again, on being compliant with major international laws like GDPR. Uh, and we yes. say, you know, sometimes in the crypto space, we say, oh, you know, regulation doesn't matter. Well, it does for enterprise applications and for companies actually in, in supply chain. And as you mentioned, advertising and digital identity, there's going to need to be this kind of standard framework that not only has what you guys are focused on, which is scalability and interoperability, but at the same time as well, offering that privacy preservation. Have I got that kind of right? 
you got that perfectly right. And also, we, when we move into the private uh, space, we basically select soft set of nodes to run these privacy preserving computation uh, governed by the entire uh, blockchain. But by doing that, you can also select into a certain jurisdiction. You can basically select into a set of nodes uh, appointed by the uh, application. And, and this sort of gives you those degrees of freedom that you will need in, in uh, any use case to address uh, privacy uh, regulation uh, and, and also a, a corporate uh, incentives to, to, to keep some information uh, private uh, or corporate and private incentives for doing that. Yeah. Very cool. So you guys have that kind of, in a sense, the framework offers flexibility for people to meet to different frameworks, privacy and standards that are being met when they're interacting with various applications or use cases. That's that's pretty exciting. I, I like that you guys offer that because sometimes I think the biggest problem is that there have been a dozen different types of layer ones or blockchains, but they always try to be this kind of one size fits all approach for whatever market they're trying to address and they don't have that offered flexibility. Very yes, cool. but that's kind of the design sort of principle for, for the entire uh, network. Very exciting. So it, it maybe if I can add to that, because it's privacy is, is, is one part of this. Uh, uh, the strategy for this is also that we uh, want to bring this uh, level of privacy to, to across all platforms. And in order to, to facilitate these uh, types of collaboration uh, with other networks, we, we, we design a completely different uh, token economy. So we decoupled uh, our own token to the uh, existing uh, token. So we bring in external coins as means of payment, which meaning that we can actually collaborate and solve privacy preserving computation for, for a partner network while boosting that partner network's token. So, so uh, and that's the economy that uh, mimic a second layer uh, solution, but, but we're yeah. still a first layer. So this is a very sort of fundamental way of approaching collaboration. And, and that, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt, but this kind of also points towards your guys' focus on interoperability as well, being able to interact and bring in liquidity from other chains, in this case, and other users. Exactly. Yeah, and we just demonstrated our first big partnership and sort of um, collaboration that is showcasing that direction. So Emergo Ventures, Emergo is the co-founding developer group of Cardano. They just uh, made an early contribution uh, to our foundation, you know, pre-launch and invested in us in both a, a collaborative and strategic way. So we are actually going to be working with them to develop and release this cross-chain private smart contract capability for all Cardano developers. And so the way it works is any Cardano developer can deploy a private smart contract on the Partija blockchain, use the MPC tokens, run private auctions, let's just pretend easy use case, a private NFT auction, finalize, and then, you know, it actually would, you know, uh, confirm the final transaction on the existing Cardano DAP. So we designed and architected everything with a very collaborative approach that we could add value to all the existing and thriving developer networks without any switching costs. So we're not saying everyone needs to come deploy their full DAP over here. You can actually leverage all our privacy uh, from your existing DAP. And so then we're moving into EVM as well. And so our strategy is we're gonna keep just releasing that capability across more of the top tier networks. Very exciting. That's awesome to hear, Brian, that you guys are gonna focus on EVM compatibility. So that knocks down a lot of the major players out there in the market like Avalanche, as well as Ethereum itself but also as well that you're working with uh, networks like Ergo and Cardano and stuff to be able to bridge those users in as well. Those are large ecosystems for sure. And I think offering that privacy preservation kind of as a service in this case, uh, as kind of additional layer two or co uh, compensation as well on top of these networks is going to be very valuable. And it'll be interesting to see some of the use cases that get built out of it. I'm curious, like one, one thing I wanted to maybe hit on guys, like about kind of where we are right now at Partisha as a blockchain. I know that there's the Zeus mainnet coming soon. So I don't know, Brian or Kurt, if you guys wanted to dive in a little bit into where Partisha is right now to get kind of the scope of, you know, are we at testnet? Are we at mainnet? Is the token live? What's the status of things? And, and really what's, what's exciting that's coming down the pipeline? Yeah, so I'll have to do a brief background kind of just based on what we just had discussed, which is, 
you know, to your point, when we architected Vertija blockchain, we knew in advance, hey, you can't just create an isolated layer one at this stage of the game and expect everyone to come to you. You need to bridge them and connect them and be collaborative. So that's why we took that approach. And so, you know, that's the interoperability. We use MPC technology to secure the oracles that facilitate the transfer of data and assets across chains. So we believe we have the most secure bridging technology. And we also require the node operators to post MPC token collateral into the nodes that are running cross-chain transactions. So if a bridge did get drained, there's an instant refund mechanism. And so we haven't seen that yet in any of the other networks. And then of course, with scalability, we have sharding built into the protocol. So those are the three areas that we researched and developed around. And so we started this research in you know, 2017, 2018, we got the foundation approval in 2020. And so since then, we've really been sprinting towards an actual mainnet. So where we're at now is all of those features, all the capabilities, they're actually in production live on Betanet. You can check out the Explorer at mpcexplorer.com. And so on May 31, we're actually so close that in about one month from today, we're doing a TGE where there is going to be this opening and decentralization of the network. There's already 70 or 80 node operators running the beta net, but as soon as it opens to the public, you know, more can register in a decentralized fashion, get their nodes running. And so all of this research and development is now culminated into it all being live. So you're seeing we're actually going to be working with Emergo on the Cardano to get the cross-chain privacy working. All the nodes, we have three tiers of nodes, Baker, Zero Knowledge, we call it Bring Your Own Coin node, that's the cross-chain uh, nodes. Mm -hmm. Everything's running, everything's in production. So yeah, for us, it is the most exciting time we've had yet in the project because we've been fundraising, we raised $50 million in the pre-sale. We now get to go to market with a real live product. You know, most companies maybe launch a token before they have the system working. We took a different approach. We're actually launching with full production and feature complete, a layer one plus two solution. And so that's what's so exciting to us. Another big thing is we just hired a new chief marketing officer from one of the largest fintech companies in the world where she launched crypto. So we can't say who or where yet, but it's official and she'll be starting on you know a few days from now. And we'll probably do a big press release in the next few weeks. So we're seeing our executive team start to form. We're also hiring a new COO who comes from an amazing you know top 10 protocol where he previously was in that same capacity and role. So, you know, we've done well fundraising, everything's production ready, and now we actually get to go to market, we're staffing out an executive team and really just growing the operation. So it's, uh, it's definitely the most exciting time after several years of, of R&D and actual work, so. I was gonna say on that point, Brian, I, I understand how difficult or frustrating it is to get to those first few steps, again, especially if you're dealing with structuring a foundation and legal entities, yeah. but, you know, hearing that you guys have been around since 2017, 2018, now you're hitting that point of velocity where you've gone through beta net in this case, and now you're really getting ready for main net here within a month or so time. I think that's very, very exciting. So I'm uh, just curious if for people who are eager to learn a little bit more about what Partesia offers, maybe even dive in if they're really on the technical side into the white paper, yellow paper, learn about some more details of the project. Are there any good places for them to visit? And just to let you guys know who are watching, I'll have the links down below in the description, but maybe Brian, Kurt, you guys want to dive into some of those key resources? Yeah, so if you just want to catch product project updates, just follow the Twitter, that's the simplest, or in the Telegram. If you want to talk more in the community, join the Telegram. If you're a developer or a node operator, though, you should join the Discord because you can come in there and there's resources to get help you get your node running. There's resources to help you start building smart contracts. So if you're on the node operator or developer side, join us in the Discord. If you want to just participate in community chat, the Telegram, or project updates, I'd say the Twitter. Awesome. Very cool. And one last thing I wanted to ask you, I want to toss the ball over to Kurt here in this case. And I wanted to ask you, Kurt, you know, like you guys have been working on this for a long period of time. I think it's very exciting as, as Brian has kind of been hinting at in this case, you guys are finally coming to this point. What are you excited to see people build on Partesia? Might be a bit of a broad question, but I'm curious, are there any use cases you're excited to see kind of materialize on Partesia that just maybe wouldn't even be possible on other chains? Yes, uh, there's quite a few actually. And, and we are working... Uh 
uh, style, in style mode on, on a number of these. So I probably cannot disclose too much about this, but, but it really, this uh, ability to do public and private uh, computation uh, within the same applications really opens up for, for sharing things in a different way to do matching things. You might be able to match very confidential things uh, and only uh, disclose the, the important parts. Uh, so, so, uh, one of the projects that we have been working on uh, before this and that led up to this uh, infrastructure is uh, on financial order matching, which is, was a project that really pushed the technology to, to the very frontier. And that is pointing at a number of things that you can do, not just within financial trading, but within matching in, in, in general. So you simply have a number of people sitting there in this case with uh, bits and ask in, in, in a and wants to find a matching order, and they they do that uh, confidentially, and and only the matches is executed and traded directly on on the on the blockchain. So you have this utilizing you're utilizing both the uh, the blockchain as an execution platform to coordinate information, but you also utilize the privacy layer as a trustee to to keep the information hidden. So and and that's sort of brings us back to what we are doing. It's all about removing middlemen. So the traditional blockchain is re removing the coordinator of information to some extent, uh, where we are adding privacy, which is removing another typical middleman, which is known as a trustee, some kind of third party that is sitting with all the private information and coordinating that. So uh, we're super excited to, to, to see the impact of this. Uh, I, th I think you're exactly right, Kurt. I think you guys, again, are removing another kind of middle layer and stuff, or at least in this case, taking that ability to have a blockchain be not only this single source of truth, but at the same time, not compromising privacy at the end of the day. And it's so critical, exactly. uh, I think, not just for, for everyday users, but for enterprise companies and a lot of the people who have still yet to come into the space fully. Um, so I'm very excited to see what people build on Partitia, guys. It's been a pleasure getting to chat with you all. I appreciate getting to, to pick your brains for a while and learn a little bit more. And um, for those of you, again, who are interested in learning a little bit more about Partesia, I'll leave the links down below in the description. But guys, thank you so much for making the time. It was really nice getting to chat with you all. Thanks, Bye. Nick. Bye, guys. Thank you. We're talking again soon. Yeah. Absolutely, guys.